Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the second annual UMass system-wide accessibility retreat. The first one, if some of you were here last year, was at UMass Amherst, um, and it was expected to be very small, and we had actually quite a crowd, and now it's grown again, and we've got vendors. So I'm going to make a few announcements. Um, I'm also going to introduce a couple of people, uh, and then we'll get into it. Uh, so first things first, this is Christina England to my left. Um, Christina and I co-chaired this event alongside so many amazing people. Uh, I'll let her I'll let her rattle off those names. <laughs> so Jody Goldstein, if you just want to stand quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Is Rachel here? Rachel Rebello? Where are you? No? Okay. Um, I do want to recognize Clara. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Hannah. Hannah's in the back in the yellow dress. She's done a lot of setup for us. John Dawson, who is our main AV guy. Thank you, John. And everyone else, including especially Kelsey, Josh, um, and anyone I might have missed. Also, Trisha, um, who is at UMass Lowell, and she's sitting out in the front. Say hi to her because her group sponsored this event. So thanks to Trisha. Oh, yeah. Oh, hello. Yes, and Rebecca. Um, okay, so there's many, many people who put sweat and tears and blood, not blood, but into this. Um, uh, no blood. Uh, I am going to make some quick announcements so everyone knows what to expect. Um, you should have all received electronic calendar invites. Those will tell you where to go when and what room your sessions are in. There are also signs posted on the doors, and we do have two people, Sean and Janelle, who can also point, if you want to stand up or raise your hand up so people know. Um, who can point you in the direction of where you need to go. Um, we also have vendor booths that you saw. I do want to make an announcement about those in case you missed it. On your name tags, there's a little like grid at the bottom and people at the different vendor booths will give you a sticker if you go and chat with them. You can chat with them in, um, in and around. They're going to be kind of walking around. Uh, Microsoft will be here a little bit late, but they will be here. So at the very end, I have my trash bucket. Um, so please stay for closing remarks because we are going to be raffling off five items from some of our vendors. Um, so what we'll have you do is if you collect all eight of your stickers, or seven really, uh, you can stick your name tag right before closing remarks in here. If you love your name tag so much you don't want to lose it forever, we will give it back to you. So please participate. <laughs> um, okay. Wi-Fi, we emailed you that information. There are also sheets on the table if that's helpful. Uh, let's see, bathrooms, located near the coat area by registration. They can point you in the direction over there if you need that. Also at the end of this hallway, towards the right, there are bathrooms over there. Um, big thanks to Text Help for the name tags. And also thanks to UMass Amherst for um, sponsoring closed captioning as well. Um, so again, thanks for all the hard work. So here we go, we're gonna start. Uh, you can see we have Luis Perez up on the screen here. Hello, Luis. He is joining us from Florida, um, and we are so lucky. I, I wrote a speech for him, but I'm not going to read it just because it feels <laughs> weird. I'm going to wing it. Um, Luis is a very, he's exceptional. Um, he's a longtime friend, a colleague of mine. Um, he is the true intersectionality. He works at the true intersectionality of disability, um, of assistive technology, technology in general, and accessibility. Um, he really focuses on the human experience, which is so important because that frequently gets lost in all of this. Um, and really it should be at the forefront of all of this. So I think we're gonna learn a lot from him today and he presents nationally and internationally, but that doesn't matter because you're gonna experience who he is and he's just amazing. Um, he has a lot of great information to share with you and uh, I'm really excited to have you and thank you, Luis, even though you just spent so much time on the road coming back from recording a TED Talk with a standing ovation at ISTE. So um, thank you so much for being here with us. We appreciate it, and we're really looking forward to this chat. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's uh, great to see you, those of you that I can see on the screen right now. Uh, just give me a second here while I get my, my uh, screen sharing going, and then we will get this show on the road. And uh, please excuse my um, sniffles today. I have a cold. So I live in beautiful Florida. We have great sunshine, great weather. But when you travel as much as I do, you can't avoid sometimes picking up some germs. All right, Kelsey, let me know if you can uh, see my screen right now. Yes, 
we can see it. <laughs> we're all set. All right, perfect. Uh, so again, uh, thanks so much, everybody. Um, I want to begin with uh, the title of this presentation. It's uh, Turn to the Light. And um, that expression is actually the motto of the high school that I attended. Uh, it's a Quaker school in Pennsylvania called the West Town School. And that idea of light has really played a key role in my life. And I'm going to keep returning back to it uh, throughout my presentation. Now, uh, when I was in high school, this expression, this motto of my school, didn't really uh, have that much meaning to me. Uh, it would really become a lot more meaningful a few years later uh, when, as an adult, uh, I was diagnosed with a visual impairment after a series of car accidents. So the condition that I have is called retinitis pigmentosa, or RP for short. And the best way to explain it is to actually take you inside my eyes. <laughs> so these are photos that were taken uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, actually at the beginning of May, as you can see from the date there, at a, one of my routine eye exams. And what you're seeing is uh, this new 3D photography that they can do of the back of the eye, the retina, uh, which is where you have your photoreceptor cells. And uh, since I have retinitis pigmentosa, you'll notice that around the center, there's this ring of dark uh, dots or splotches. And that's basically where the photoreceptor cells have died. And that is my blind spot. That's where I can no longer see. And so my life is really full of surprises <laughs> in the sense that I can see all the way out on the periphery. So if I hold my hand out, I can see some movement there. But then as I move my hand in, it disappears uh, until it appears just sort of around the middle. And so depending on uh, the day, it could be a good day, it could be a bad day. Um, I have about seven to 10 degrees of central vision. Uh, and a good way to sort of get an idea of what RP is like, if you'll join me in doing this, is if you take your hands and you make some uh, two small circles with them, and then you try looking through those small circles. In a way, that's what it's like looking, um, seeing with retinitis pigmentosa. You only see a very small area in front of you, uh, but the outside of that center in the middle, you can't see you can't perceive that information. So this makes uh, navigating the environment quite a challenge. It makes things like stairs, like curbs, uh, uh, small children, pets like dogs and cats that I can't see when they're underneath me, that makes it quite a challenge. But uh, retinitis pigmentosa is more than what happens with my eyes. Retinitis pigmentosa for me is a lived experience. It's something that I've lived with for uh, more than 15 years now. So in order to capture that experience, um, I wrote a poem. And I would like to share that with you now. And the name of the poem is Entre, or Between. So here it goes. Neither here nor there, neither blind nor sighted. I see you, but not all of you. You see me, but not all of me. Ni aquí, ni allá the islands, the city, the country. Espanol, Spanglish, English. Y hoy, quien soy? Ay, quien sabe? So I learned to live in between, in and out of the shadows. And as the light turns to dark and the darkness comes to life, I have learned to just dance, just dance in those shadows. So what this poem really captures is my experience as somebody who lives, who lives in between and betwixt. Um, as a person with a visual impairment, I'm neither fully sighted nor fully blind. I really live in that in-between space. As an immigrant and as a person of color, uh, my whole life has been about living between and betwixt. Uh, I came to a new country when I was 11 years old. I had to learn English from scratch. And so during those early years, and even after that, my whole life pretty much, I've learned to switch back and forth between uh, different languages, between different cultures. Uh, unfortunately, school often wants us to make a choice, uh, either by assigning us to a category 
or assigning us a label. But life is not always that neatly organized. So one of the things that I work for is for our schools to recognize that intersectionality. Um, I joke with people sometimes that I have not been Hispanic for the last two decades. And what I mean by that is that because I have a white cane, which you can maybe see behind me, um, I use a white cane for navigation. That's the first thing that people see about me. And that's really the thing that dominates their perception of me. But underneath that, you know, I'm a person of color. Like I said, I'm an immigrant. And those experiences also shape my experience of disability. So that's one of the things I like to explore is that intersectionality. Now today I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin as a person with a disability, but that wasn't always the case. When I was first diagnosed um, with my visual impairment, I kind of went through all the emotions that you would probably expect. You know, I was uh, angry, I was sad, um, one of the things that I remember about that experience is that the doctors just told me that I was going to lose my vision, but they didn't really give me any ideas of things that I could do to make my life better. And that's another of the things that I'm trying to work on is how to get the medical profession to not just focus on what's going on in your eyes, but also what needs to happen in your life. What are the skills, what are the strategies that you need to have in place so that, you know, you can cope with uh, the diagnosis and you can move forward with your life. So that those first few years after I was diagnosed with my visual impairment, I really went into a depression, a deep, deep depression. And I almost didn't make it, you know, I, I kind of lost hope. So there were three things that kind of helped me step out of the shadows, step out of the darkness, if you will, and turn to the light. The first one was my family my friends. Without them, I wouldn't be here today. Um, especially my daughter, uh, who you see here on this photo, uh, because wanting to be a good role model for her really encouraged me to reach out and get help, which is not always easy in my culture, especially as a Hispanic male. But just wanting to be around for her really pushed me to get help and to be a better person and want to be better and do better. And I wasn't sure when I was first diagnosed with my visual impairment if I would get to see this moment. But I'm happy to report that just a few weeks ago, she graduated from high school. I was able to be there and I was able to witness that. Uh, it's one of the proudest moments of my life. And she's on her way to college in the fall. She got into the college of her preference, so I could not be happier and more proud of her. The second thing that helped me step out of the shadows and into the light was discovering assistive technology. And what happened is by chance, one day I was in the computer lab at my university. I'm sure you have a similar one there at UMass. And I was setting up a new computer as part of my job when I discovered this feature called voiceover. And I turned on voiceover just to see what it was. And I heard this, and hopefully you'll be able to hear this as well. Welcome to VoiceOver. VoiceOver speaks descriptions of items on the screen and can be used to control the computer using only your keyboard. The VoiceOver Quick Start. In this Quick Start, you'll learn VoiceOver basics as well as important VoiceOver commands to help you navigate on your Mac and hear that. All right, so that is Alex. But as it turns out, Alex is not actually a person. <laughs> Alex is the synthesized speech that's used by the voiceover screen reader. Uh, at that time, when I discovered it, it was only available on the Mac. But since Apple has added it to the iPhone, to the iPad, and if you still have an iPod Touch somewhere, that is also available on that device. So I've, descri I've described Alex or meeting Alex as a magical moment. And the reason why I say that is because it was that instant where I knew that in just a moment, my life would change forever. And um, Alex didn't just speak to my ears. Um, I mean, obviously you could hear the voice is really high quality and everything, but that's not what was important. Uh, what was important was the message that the computer or uh, that the technology communicated to me. Uh, and it was a message of hope. 
And one of the things that I always tell educators, that I always tell people that work with, uh, you know, individuals who need assistive technology, is to, that's the first step, is focusing on hope. Because I, I truly believe with hope, um, you know, learners can overcome any obstacle. Without hope, even the smallest barrier will get in their way and hold them back. Now, I'm not that naive. Um, obviously, there are structural issues that we need to address, right? Um, no matter how good your attitude is, um, there's no way to convert stairs into ramp magically, <laughs> into a ramp. So there are structural issues that we need to address as well when it comes to accessibility. But in terms of that personal journey, uh, where you come to terms with your disability and you move forward and you discover those strategies and those tools that you need, it, before you're able to do that, I think it has to start with giving the person hope that they can take control of their life, that they can live with agency. So that's what I mean by that. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. The final thing that really helped me step out of the shadows again and turn to the light was just finding joy in everyday life. And the way that I did that was by taking up a hobby, but not just any hobby. I decided to take up photography, which is an interesting hobby for somebody with a significant visual impairment. And actually what you're seeing on the screen is my first camera. Uh, which I received as a gift from my brother when he updated to a more powerful model. So um, how many of you remember what well, 1.3 megapixels was a lot? <laughs> so that was my first camera. And of course, nowadays my phone can do even better than that. But this got me on my way. So here are a few of my photos, just as an example, or a sampling of them. Um, I love, since I live in Florida, I, I live not too far from the beach. Um, I always tell people that I have a, like, just like a camera, you know, with a camera, you have a limited number of shutter presses before the camera can't take any more photos. Well, my eyes have a limited number of sunsets at this point because there is no cure for retinitis pigmentosa. So what I try to do is just take in as much as I can of the visual world and sunsets is something that I love. And so I'll continue to try to go out to the beach as much as I can and, you know, catch those beautiful Florida sunsets. Uh, this is a photo that I took with a special add-on lens that's available for the iPhone. Uh, it allows you to get up close on, you know, the world around you. And so this is a close-up of a flower that I took. And then um, photos, you know, you can find good photos anywhere. Uh, this was taken at a Walmart. At the entrance of many Walmarts, you'll find a machine that has a claw that reaches down to allow you to pick out toys. And I just saw this balloon sitting there and it looked like it was an alien, so I took a photo of it. So there's just beauty um, all around you and it's just a matter of learning to appreciate it. So that's what I try to do. However, um, also let me mention, if you wanna see more of my photos and my travels, because that's really when I'm taking the most photos is when I'm traveling, you can go to Instagram and you can look me up as LFP. Those are my initials. I like Larry, F like Frank, P like Peter, 1211, LFP 1211. So you can go there, you can follow me, you can check out more of my photos. Now, here's the thing. If you are just focusing on the photos, then you might miss the big picture. See what I did there? <laughs> So pardon the pun, but um, for me, uh, photography is more than just about the photos because there's a good chance that someday I will not be able to see them. So uh, there's a blind photographer named Pete Eckert. I think he put it best. The photos are for you. The event of taking them is for me. And what I mean by that is that uh, photography for me is more than just an artistic endeavor. It's really a political one. Uh, the camera is my tool as an advocate. So for me, photography is really about being visible as a person with a disability. Um, I think we live at a time in our country when my rights as a person with a disability, as a person of color, as an immigrant, are on the constant attack. And so it's more important than ever for me to be visible and to just show that I'm here, 
I'm proud of who I am and I'm not going away. So that's what photography is all about for me. It's about being visible. Uh, photography makes me visible in the physical space. So when I go out somewhere and I take out my Y cane and some sort of camera, here I'm using the iPhone, but I also have a camera hanging from my shoulder. Um, it really forces people to reconsider their preconceived ideas of what it means to have a visual impairment or any kind of disability. And then of course, when I share those photos online, again, it's making me visible in those spaces where a lot of our conversations are taking place now. Uh, you all probably share photos on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat, whatever the kids are using these days. Well, I want to be part of those spaces as well. I want to show that as a person with a disability, I belong in those spaces. And photography is a way for me to do that. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just turn over to my iPad. If everything works out well, we will see about that. And then just do a quick, a few quick demos for you. So here is my iPad. Let me see if I can get this uh, full screen. Just to remove some of the uh, distractions there. All right, so Kelsey, can you let me know? Can you see my iPad just fine? Yes, I can see your iPad. It looks good. All right, All right. so the first thing I wanna cover here is how do I take photos? So on my iPad, there's a feature called VoiceOver, as I mentioned earlier. And what I'm gonna do is just triple click the home button. I have an accessibility shortcut set up. This is something you can set up in uh, your settings for your iPad or other iOS device. And I'm gonna triple click the home button to turn on VoiceOver. Voice over on, landscape. Home button to the right, camera. Double tap to open. When I turn on voice over, I get all this information, right? The orientation of my device, what app or, for the, or, or folder I'm on, and so on. The way that I navigate with voice over, uh, there's two ways. I can move my finger around on the screen, and then it's gonna read whatever is underneath my finger. Or the way that a lot of us who use voice over a lot do it is we flick. So we'll perform a one finger flick and that will move uh, this uh, square that you see around the camera app. That's called a voiceover cursor. So that determines what's gonna be read out loud. So I can flick to the right with one finger and I'll move to the next item. Playgrounds, double tap to open. Or I could flick in the other direction and that will move me back one item. So it's a very linear process when you do it this way. It goes from left to right, top to bottom. Camera. Double tap to open. All right, let me get ready for my uh, close up here. So um, as voiceover has uh, told me because I've had the hints turned on, um, it's a two step process. First, you have to move the voiceover cursor to the item you want to interact with, and then you can double tap. And here's the cool thing. You can double tap anywhere on the screen. So basically the entire screen becomes one big button. And that's there because as a person with a visual impairment, I may not know where on the screen that camera uh, icon is for that app. So with this um, method, I basically just move the cursor around. When it gets to the item that I want, I can double tap. So let's take a look at taking a photo. Camera, viewfinder, flash on, zero faces. One face, large face, face near right edge. One face, large face, face centered. All right, so. One face, small face, face near bottom right edge. What you Home, camera. What Double you saw there, open. I'm going to, it's lagging a little bit, so let me uh, wait for it to catch up. What you saw there is the facial recognition that's built into iOS devices. And with this facial recognition, if you wanna take a portrait, it will let you know how many faces are in the picture. It will let you know um, their relative location in the frame. So as somebody who doesn't have any peripheral vision, this is really helpful to me. Uh, it allows me to uh, you know, be able to take a portrait just like anybody else. So let me try to exit out of here. I'm gonna launch this app again because when I opened up the camera, it kind of slowed down a little bit. So give me one second while I do that. I'm gonna turn off voiceover. Voiceover off. Talk amongst yourselves. All 
I'll launch it again and then hopefully it will come back. Any of you ever done a technology demo where everything goes perfectly? <laughs> if you are, you are a unique person because that's never happened to me and I present just about every week. So let's see, it looks like we're back here. Let me see if there's, there's still a little bit of a lag. So what I'm gonna do is just end it and then bring it back. It happens to the best of us, right? So let's launch this. Hope we're able to reconnect. All right, there we go. I'm not even gonna put it in full screen, just in case. Uh, one of the things you'll probably notice, you see this cursor on the screen there? That's one of the first adjustments that I make on any device, because I can't see the cursor. So I go into the settings and I make the cursor as big as possible. I'll try to add a shadow or a trail. And then um, the other thing is I have alerts on. So if you hear voiceover come on unexpectedly, Lindy, that's because- your screen, it's got the screen mirroring thing up, just so you know. I, I know, I'm gonna bring okay. it up in a second. Just explaining on the Mac here, on top of the uh, iPad. Um, this is the cursor on my Mac. You can see how big it is. Um, I also have other features, like I'll have announcements, because sometimes a dialog box will pop up and I may be looking at the bottom of the screen and I can't see where it is. So sometimes I'll just wait for a second and I will let uh, VoiceOver announce that. And then I can, you know, I know what that dialog is doing for me. All right, so here's my iPad, we're back. All right, so what I wanna do is show you why this is important beyond just photography. It's important uh, because it has implications for just overall accessibility. Uh, it turns out that uh, whenever you take a photo, so here's one of those photos, I'm gonna turn on voiceover and I'm going to tap on that photo with three fingers to get information about it. Voiceover on, photos, foot landscape, foot peer, slightly blurry, bright, possible text. 10, 32 a.m., July 9th, 2017, 4.07 p.m., photo 205, full width of screen. So I don't know if you could hear at the beginning, it told me that it's a peer, and it gave me information about the lighting and whether it's sharp or not. I'm gonna flick with three fingers to go to the next photo. Photo three of five, photo, landscape, July 9th, 2017, 4 p.m., sunrise, sunset, slightly blurry, bright, Possible text, 10, 32 a.m., July 9th, 2000. And uh, it doesn't know if it's a sunset or sunrise, so it try to guess. But uh, it does a pretty good job. The, the next two are the pretty impressive ones here. I'm going to flick with three fingers again. Photo 4 of 5, photo, landscape, July 9th, 2017, 4.08 p.m., Lily, slightly blurry, bright, possible text. 10.33 a.m. July 9th. I can tap anytime with two fingers and pause voiceover. Um, I had no idea that this was a lily when I took this photo, but uh, the recognition can go in, the object recognition can go in and pick that out. So I have one more, this one's pretty cool. Photo 5 of 5, photo, landscape, July 9th, 2017, 4.35 p.m. Heron, sharp, bright, possible text. 10.33 a.m., July 9th. I don't know if you could hear that, but it actually identified that properly as a heron. Uh, again, that's something that I didn't know when I was taking this photo. But later on, I can go in and that recognition can do that for me. Uh, so it turns out this is not an accessibility feature. Uh, this is actually a search feature. Uh, as we take more and more photos and we store them on our devices, it becomes harder and harder to find these photos. So what Apple is doing here is using object recognition to automatically detect some of the objects in the photo so that then you can search for them. So you can search for a baby, you can search for a dog, you know, these common objects. And so again, that has implications for accessibility because um, Microsoft, for instance, on the latest versions of Office, in Office 365, they're actually using computer vision, which is what this is called, right? Where you could recognize those objects. They're using that to identify objects in your presentations, in your Word documents, and then automatically assign descriptions. 
Uh, now, the nice thing about the approach Microsoft is taking is that you can go in and you can edit those descriptions. So I'm always in favor of kind of giving you a head start with the automatic descriptions, but always giving you that option of being able to edit it because we're not quite there yet with computer vision and with AI uh, to be able to just rely on it um, you know, automatically. So we need a little bit of help. I'm going to turn, um, speaking of Microsoft, Cam. Uh, there's an app that I love to use called Seeing AI. So I'm going to open up Seeing AI and show you that also has a camera option. Seeing AI, double tap, menu, button, channel, short text, adjustable, short text, document, product, person, zero faces, switch to front camera, button, switch Louis near center, two feet away. Hopefully you could hear that. It actually said Luis. Luis near center, two feet away. Seeing it. So Microsoft has built on top of that facial recognition and it's trying to do distance. And it's also, um, you can train it. So if you're always taking photos of the same person, you can take say three or four photos of a person and then you can have that um, be recognized as well. So, uh, it's important, though, to uh, let you know that not all apps build in this support for VoiceOver. VoiceOver is an API. It's an application programming interface. And developers have to build um, support for it. And um, it's lagging again, but I want to do a quick demo. And actually, if you can't see this, this is fine, because I don't want to identify the guilty here. I'm just going to launch an app that doesn't have VoiceOver support. So, Tinker. Tinker, text field, double tap to edit. And this is the case with a lot of educational apps and a lot of games. If I move my finger around on the screen, there's nothing I can do really. Tech, text, text field, text field, text field, text field, text field, text field, double tap to edit. That's typical of an app like this that has a custom interface. Um, they have not labeled any of the controls on the screen. So I will hear a text field repeatedly, or I will hear button repeatedly. But if the button doesn't have a label, then there's no way for me to tell what the button does. So it's important when we design these interfaces that we go in and make sure that they support the APIs, that they are properly labeled so that we know what the control or element does. Um, so again, I hate to pick on Tinker, but the reason why I did that is because coding right now is really popular in K-12 education. I don't know about higher ed, but the idea of teaching coding as another language, as another skill to prepare our workforce, is really big right now. But if we don't make these apps accessible, then we're leaving out a population from you know, um, that area of the curriculum. Uh, and so it's important to make coding apps, just like any other app, uh, accessible to all students. And it can be done. Tinker. Double tap to open. If you are um, going to the App Store, you can download an app called Swift Playgrounds from Apple. And that's an app uh, where it teaches coding. It has a full curriculum built into it. And it's fully accessible to voiceover. So I always highlight that as an example that uh, it can be done. It just may take a little bit more effort. Um, but the APIs are out there. The documentation is out there. Um, if we do that, then that means things like coding, things like science, like STEM, are accessible to um, all students. All right, so I'm going to pause here for um, a second while I switch back to my presentation, see if there are any questions for me so far. If anyone does have questions, I have a microphone so he can hear you. So just raise your hand and I'll come over to you. It's radio silent, Luis. Nope, just kidding. Matthew Mattingly. Um, hi, I was curious, is this, can you hear me? Um, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Um, when you use a, a regular handheld camera rather than the, um, the, the pad with the built-in voiceover and stuff, how accessible is that? Is some of the information um, only displayed on screens and so on? How do you deal with that? It's not very accessible, unfortunately. Um, first of all, uh, I am already looking through a tunnel because of my condition. And most of the time I have to look, when I'm out shooting in bright light, I have to look through the viewfinder 
because the screen is also difficult uh, for me to see. And so um, that's, that's an issue, being able to look through the viewfinder because I can't see much of the stuff already. Um, most of them don't have options for making any of the items on the screen bigger, which I need, or changing the contrast. Uh, those are all options that I have on my iOS device or, or any of these tablets, right? An Android tablet, um, you know, whatever tablet you're using, whatever phone you're using, I prefer the phone just for the portability of it. Um, you can make the text larger. You can change the background of the screen. Uh, it's just highly customizable, way more than a camera. Um, I can't see the markings on any of the knobs or any of the different options, you know, physical buttons on the camera either. Um, whereas with the, uh, you know, the touch screen on an iOS device or another tablet or phone, I can use screen reader to read all those controls to me. Uh, so I do shoot with a camera sometimes because uh, one of the things I don't get with a phone or a tablet is zoom. And so occasionally I will put on a long lens and go out and shoot. Um, there are things here in Florida that you want to kind of keep your distance from them, like, you know, alligators <laughs> and snakes. And so uh, those are favorite of mine to photograph, but I have to keep my distance. And so in those situations, I use uh, a camera with a long lens, but it does tire me out. So I, I don't do it as often. Thank Hope you. that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Sure thing. All and right, so. We're good, okay, keep going. All right, so I will come back at the end and answer any questions that are left. So. Obviously, there's lots of apps on these devices as well that I can use for things like uh, capturing text, having it read out loud to me. Uh, there's just a lot of different options out there. But you'll be surprised. The two most important apps that I have on my devices that have made the biggest difference in my life. Anybody want to guess? Any guesses? Siri. <laughs> Siri. Anybody else? They're all whispering. <laughs> all right, here, I'll give you the answer. Those are the two apps, if you, hopefully you can see that still. Lyft and Uber. Um, as a person with a visual impairment, one of the things that I struggled with uh, when I was first diagnosed is how am I gonna get around? And these apps were not around at that time. And um, it was really difficult because all of a sudden I lost my independence. I couldn't drive. And, uh, you know, I could take a cab, but cabs are pretty expensive and they're also really unreliable. So when Lyft and Uber came about, it was like a game changer for me because now I hardly ever have to wait more than a few minutes uh, where I live or most major cities. They'll pick me up within, I think, no less, no more than 10 minutes in most cases. And I can track where I'm going. I can track my estimated time of arrival. These have just been amazing. I can track that on my Apple Watch as well. Uh, so Lyft and Uber, I know there's some issues with them with ADA compliance and the like, but um, trust me as somebody who uses them a lot, this is a lot better than the solution I had before, uh, which is just relying on cabs or public transportation, which is kind of spotty uh, where I live. Um, I live in the South and basically all we have is buses and they're not all that reliable either. So those two have changed my life. And the final thing that I rely on is I love to read. But um, right now, what I mostly rely on is uh, EPUB books that I access on my tablet. And with these books, I can go in and I can customize the reading experience. I can make the text bigger. I can go in and I can change the background so that I have more contrast. And then, of course, if my eyes get tired, uh, there's this feature called Speak Screen. And what I'll do is I'll just use Siri and I'll say speak screen and it'll start reading automatically from the top of the screen. And it'll even flip the pages for me when it gets to the bottom. So it's basically a continuous reading mode. So if you haven't tried that before, I would encourage you to do that. Um, you can just use Siri for that or you can perform a special gesture, but um, it's something that you first have to turn on in your settings. So a speak screen is something that I use all the time with uh, reading, especially towards the end of the day when my eyes get tired. Uh, so, of course, um, I focus on the technology, but it's important um, to recognize that the content needs to be accessible as well. And so one of the things that I did a while back is this infographic. Um, it's called um, 
SLIDE, S-L-I-D-E, and it stands for uh, five different uh, tips for making content more accessible. Uh, the first is using styles, so making sure that you're properly structuring your document using headings. Uh, headings provide additional navigation for screen readers because we can bring up a list of those headings and then we can skip anywhere that we want within a long document without having to read the whole document from top to bottom. Uh, the other is making your links descriptive. So avoiding links that say click here or here. Uh, just like with headings, I can bring up a list of all the links in a document, but if they all say click here, then I don't know what here is referring to. So just making sure that instead you select some text that's descriptive and you make that the link. Obviously, adding images, um, accessibility descriptions or alternative text to images, that's one of the basics of accessibility. Uh, so people who can't see those images get that information. And then for people with cognitive uh, limitations or disabilities, you know, having a clean and predictable design, it means that they can focus their attention on learning the content rather than how it's designed. And then the final thing that I'll leave you with is just having this empathy or ethic of care when we're designing. That we're not just designing for us now, uh, but a famous web developer called Adrian Rosselli said, design for future you, not for current you, that's able-bodied, but for future you who as a result of aging may have a disability. And when we go you know, into our retirement years, our uh, possibilities of having a disability increase dramatically. So design for future you, uh, if nothing else, he calls it selfish accessibility. Uh, you, we will all need these things uh, at some point in the future. So here is a uh, QR code. You can actually download a, a blog post that has that information in the infographic in a more accessible format. It is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y, slide into access. So basically my final thought here is, um, you know, for most people, technology makes things uh, easier. For some of us, technology makes things possible. So I would like to close with this example. This is my friend, Logan uh, Prickett. Uh, Logan, when he was 13, he went into the doctor for a routine MRI and he had an allergic reaction to the dye that was injected uh, prior to the MRI. He went into a coma. And when he came out of the coma, he was blind. He had significant motor disabilities or impairments. And because they crushed his vocal cords during life-saving measures, uh, he can't speak above a whisper. So the challenge for us, uh, I was working with a team at Auburn University, was how to enable Logan to participate in his education alongside his peers. So what we did is we developed a complex communication system built around his iPhone. Uh, you can see there, there's some speakers mounted in the back of his wheelchair to amplify his voice. There's a microphone connected to everything to make sure that you know, his voice is captured and amplified appropriately. And then he used uh, both voiceover and the switch access features built into the iPhone using a custom switch interface that was built into the uh, arm of his wheelchair. So the result of all this, just a few weeks ago, Logan graduated from Auburn University at Montgomery. Not only did he graduate, he graduated in four years, he graduated with honors. And not only that, but he's also a published author because together, the two of us co-authored a book chapter on accessible technology. So basically, my final thought here is, um, when thinking about technology is not to do for other people what they can do for themselves. Um, our goal as educators, as assistive technology experts, as accessibility experts, is to just put those tools in the hands of learners that allow, empower them to accomplish their goals, whatever they may be. So my message to you is to be the spark, to light the path, and above all else, join me in making more light. Uh, and I love to end with this quote from Peter Reynolds. Uh, he said, there's more good than bad in this world, more light than darkness, and you can make more light. And that's our role as educators. That's what we bring to the world is we bring more light into the world. So will you join me in making more light? I hope you will. Thank you so much. I will take any questions that you have for me. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you to this morning.
we will leave two minutes for questions because we'll have sessions that everyone else will need to get to and of course vendor booths out there too. Does anyone have a question for Louise before we split out? Don't be shy. Yeah, hold on one second. We have a question. I actually have a recommendation for using your phone for uh, long range shots. There's a equipment called Beast Grip. It's a, uh, a mount you put your phone on and you can actually put on a, a lens that you can zoom in. So you could have the accessibility features with that zoom factor as well. Uh, absolutely. I forgot to mention Logan is a hunter. Oh. And he actually hunts using uh, a scope that he mounts his phone onto and it allows him to go out and hunt. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, I know that there's things out there. Um, I just haven't explored them in more detail, but thanks for suggesting that. Uh, one more question. Hi, do you find that, um, do you use chat a lot out of curiosity? Is that something that you, you know, use as a medium to communicate since it's, I would think it's, built-in accessible? <laughs> um, I do, uh, and Logan does as well, and some of the other people that I work with. Uh, one of the issues that we're having sometimes is with emojis. People love to use emojis in their chat conversations, and um, screen readers are getting better with it, but a lot of times they'll interpret the emojis uh, literally, <laughs> and that's not necessarily what the person meant. Um, and then also, if you do a message with a bunch of emojis in a row, it kind of becomes difficult to um, parse out that conversation. So it's something to be aware of. Uh, but um, I have worked with a person who is um, nonverbal uh, with cerebral palsy, so she's not able to speak. And uh, she's taught a course for me. Uh, she's come in as a virtual instructor. And we did it all through Facebook chat. <laughs> So she had some messages already programmed into her keyboard that she could respond. And then obviously it took a bit of time for her to type, but uh, she was able to do that through chat. So definitely things like chat uh, open up a whole world um, of connection, which is really important for people with disabilities because, um, you know, somebody with a rare condition like mine, I could have gone through all through school without meeting somebody else in the same position. But through support groups, through chat, um, we're able to meet each other in the virtual space. Um, we're able to support each other and just stay in touch. Luis, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And everybody else, your next session starts at 11. Thank you. See you, everybody. Take care. Have a good day. <laughs>